too kind. You're too kind. Thanks for being here. I'm Zach. This is Marta. That was a wonderful talk by Jonathan. And I think we are lucky to be able to continue the conversation around some of the first principles of why we are all here. Now, Marta, you've been here since 2015. What got you interested in the space? And do you still share those views today, seven years later? Yeah, you know, I absolutely do. Um, for me, the thing that was so interesting about cryptocurrency was the possibility that it could really import the civil liberties benefits of cash into the online world. So the, res the resistance from financial censorship, uh, the resistance from financial surveillance. Um, and for me, that really was sort of the first principles of what made me interested in this space. Um, and fundamentally, you know, when you get really down to it, what are we doing here? A big part of what we're doing is all about digital rights. It's all about civil liberties. Got it. And I think there's just so many like fascinating things that have happened in the last, last like three to six months even that heighten the stakes of this conversation. I think the one that stands out to me is Tornado Cash, OFAC taking dramatic step to sort of sanction an entire open source code base. Uh, there's other examples, of course. And I guess my question is to you, how are we trending as it relates to the financial freedoms that a lot, of this pe a lot of people in this room are working towards? Are we trending downward, upward, stasis? What's your assessment of the current state of play? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that one of the things that we've seen that's been a growing trend in recent years and that's really been, I think, accelerating is that there is a lot of surveillance in the traditional financial system. And what we're seeing is that that surveillance is being extended over time into the world of cryptocurrency. Um, and we're really, I think, at this inflection point because the whole sort of ethos of cryptocurrency, the reason for its existence, is really um, at odds with this general idea of financial surveillance. And so I think we're at this moment in time where we are starting to have the surveillance of the traditional banking system extended onto cryptocurrency. And that is actually making us pause and say, well, why is there so much surveillance in the traditional financial system? And is it okay for that to extend to cryptocurrency? And if not, is it okay for that surveillance to continue to exist in the traditional financial system as well? Um, and I would argue, and I'm happy to go into this, um, that actually the amount of surveillance that we've seen in the traditional financial system, um, in my view, is actually unconstitutional and is actually quite problematic. Yeah, we've seen these conversations unfolding. I think like putting in a plug for a recent debate between Sam Bankman-Fried and Eric Voorhees. A lot of the conversation has been unfolding on Twitter and on video in recent days. You know, I think that conversation really boils down to, you know, what are the bright red lines that must be defended as we bring these decentralized technologies to the mainstream? And when you say words like, you know, surve surveillance to the extent that we see it in the traditional system is unconstitutional, what for you is that bright red line that I think people who are working in policy realms such as yourself need to defend when they're talking with regulators and policymakers the world over. What are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think really seeing that debate and, and what's been happening in the discussions around that, I think that it fundamentally gets down to this idea of, okay, when we're talking to regulators, when we're talking to policymakers, are we going to come to the table and are we going to be okay with compromises that fundamentally make our space centralized, that fundamentally undermine the principles that we're all here for in the first place? Um, my answer to that is that um, is no, is that we sh that we shouldn't accept that, um, and I think that. Um going even further, um, I actually think that this is a good moment for us to think about financial surveillance even broader than cryptocurrency, to really think about financial surveillance as it exists in the current world, um, and, and really think about whether um, that is constitutional. And so um, the reason for that is that um, there is a massive amount of information that gets turned over to the governments by default without a warrant in today's traditional banking system. Um, I'm a US lawyer and in the United States we have this thing called the Fourth Amendment um, that prevents uh, basically governments from searching, you know, looking at your information uh, unless they have probable cause and go to a court and actually get a warrant for that information. 
And so why is it then that it's okay for massive amounts of information to be handed over to the government by default without a warrant when it comes to financial transactions, which is what happens in today's system under, for example, the Bank Secrecy Act? Well, the reason for that is this thing called the third party doctrine. And the third party doctrine is this idea that you lose your reasonable expectation of privacy in any information that is turned over to a third party. So that means if you're using Gmail, if you're going to a bank, um, if you are using Facebook, all of that information is shared with a third party, and therefore you've lost your reasonable expectation of privacy in that information. And the government can not only ask for that information without a warrant, they can actually create programs, as they have with our financial data, to have that massive amount of information turned over to the government uh, just, just as a default. Um, and you know, I think um, for me, really thinking about this moment in time, we've really seen um, that the Supreme Court has really been chipping away at the third party doctrine. Um, you know, the case that sort of made this law uh, was a, a case back in the 1970s, U.S. v. Miller, and it was basically a question of, does the financial surveillance of the Bank Secrecy Act violate the Fourth Amendment? And at the time in the 1970s, you know, what the Supreme Court said was, that's totally fine because you've you've handed over your information to a bank, right, a third party. So under the third party doctrine, um, you know, it's totally fine. But what we've seen is in recent years, the Supreme Court is starting to see that actually all of our lives, our daily lives are now lived through corporations, right? You can't go a single second without your data being handed over to, to third parties, right? Right now, there are probably 10 20, 100 different third parties that know your location alone, right? Just as an example, based on just having a phone in your pocket. Um, and so um, I really think that this is kind of the moment for us to think about, is it okay for these systems to continue to exist, um, or should we be really pushing on the constitutionality of the financial system in general? Um, because if not, it's going to get extended to cryptocurrency. And that's what we're seeing, just with one example being Tornado Cash. I guess my question is, like, what are you seeing as, I mean, right, there's this misperception that crypto is not regulated. That's just simply not the case in most jurisdictions, right? The question is whether it's well regulated, and something we hear often is, you know, square peg, round hole. The idea of cryptocurrency, these permissionless open ledgers, doesn't really neatly fit with existing regulations for the traditional financial system. So I guess my question is, as we seek to find alignment between those frameworks, what has been effective, what has been ineffective in advancing those conversations among policymakers as you see it in this point in time? Yeah, you know, I think just zooming out to sort of big picture uh, regulation in the cryptocurrency space, I think there's this really harmful myth that cryptocurrency is unregulated and that it's the Wild West and that what we need is a lot of regulation in the space. Um, in reality, cryptocurrency is heavily regulated. So the on-ramps and the off-ramps where you're buying and selling and custodying cryptocurrency, um, those are all uh, doing know your customer checks, they're um, registering with FinCEN, uh, they're doing annual inspections, they're chartered bank companies, right? These are heavily, heavily regulated entities. Um, and I think furthermore, um, I really object to this idea that we need to regulate cryptocurrency because we really shouldn't be regulating uh, technologies. We don't regulate technologies, we regulate activities. Um, so to give you an example, if you're committing fraud, it doesn't matter whether you're committing fraud using the telephone or pen and paper or cryptocurrency or email, that fundamentally the technology is is absolutely irrelevant. Um, you know, you can go after someone for fraud. Um, and we really do already sensibly apply existing laws and regulations in the cryptocurrency space. Um, and so I really object to a lot of these ideas that the cryptocurrency space is unregulated and that what we need to do is come in and regulate cryptocurrency. So I think you would probably describe OFAC's actions against Tornado Cash as an overreach. What's next? How do you correct that overreach? What 
like what's the next step there? I think it's drawn a lot of people, they're all up in arms about this action against an open source code base. How do you advance this conversation to somewhere more productive than this blanket approach that we've seen from uh, a major US enforcement agency? Yeah, absolutely. So, so what happened there was um, not very long ago, just a couple months ago, um, there's a Department of the Treasury that keeps sort of the sanctions list. And this is a list of individuals and companies that people in the US can't do business with. These are sanctioned individuals or companies. Um, and what OFAC did, um, which is the Department of the Treasury that keeps this list, is they added to this list Tornado Cash. Um, and Tornado Cash uh, is a, a mixer um, that really uh, increases the privacy of cryptocurrency transactions because, of course, cryptocurrency transactions are often not anonymous but rather pseudonymous. So there's quite a lot of information that you can actually get from cryptocurrency transaction public records. And so the idea behind having something like Tornado Cash is you can actually get a little bit more privacy. Um, to me, uh, OFAC adding Tornado Cash, the entire protocol, to this sanctions list was absolutely galling for so many reasons. Um, one reason that it's galling is just adding an entire protocol to a sanctions list, an open source project. Um, it's wild. It's absolutely wild. Um, the second reason um, that it, it, it really is, is so galling to me uh, is fundamentally that you know, OFAC, I think, when they were doing this, were not really thinking about the chilling effect that it would have on programmers, right? So suddenly what we saw was, even if it wasn't technically necessary, um, GitHub pulling down the code, right? Um, and what we saw was um, actually a developer in the Netherlands getting arrested um, for uh, a developer who had been working on the Tornado Cache protocol. Um, we still, I think, don't know for what. Um, and really, fundamentally, what this comes down to is that OFAC is taking the position that a technology that enables privacy is bad and illegal, and that Americans can interact with that technology. And I just want to challenge this idea that enabling privacy and anonymity is somehow bad or is somehow illegal. In fact, those types of technologies are absolutely critical to civil liberties, absolutely critical to civil liberties. Um, and this really isn't the first time we've seen government agencies taking these positions. We've seen this position about, people taking this position about uh, anonymity enhanced currencies, um, which is a, a term made up by uh, government agencies in the United States to describe uh, privacy coins, um, taking the position that these are really, their purpose is to commit crimes. Um, and I think if we allow the government to get away Way with taking these positions that, that anything that increases anonymity is bad or illegal, um, what you're really talking about, it goes so far beyond just the cryptocurrency space, right? These are the same arguments that we hear made against encryption and uh, anonymity enhancing technologies like Tor. Um, and so I really think it's important for people far beyond the cryptocurrency space to look at this to look at what OFAC has done with Tornado Cash and to really push back because this is going to be the, uh, what, what they say, you know, bad facts make bad law. Even if you think that this is bad facts somehow, which frankly I don't, um, I think we all, uh, beyond the cryptocurrency space, if you care about civil liberties, if you care about privacy, um, should be fighting really hard against what OFAC has done here. All right, so that's all well and good, and I think it speaks to your personal beliefs, right? But you run the legal department of a fairly prominent project in the space. How does this recent action inform your work as it relates to supporting the growth of the Filecoin ecosystem? Yeah, so, you know, I think fundamentally when you get down to what we're doing, um, you know, really what we are doing um, both at Protocol Labs and the Filecoin Foundation um, is working on using decentralized technologies uh, for really, um, for use cases like the one you just saw a few minutes ago, right? Um, Starling Labs, um, where they're using this technology, these decentralized technologies for things like authenticating videos of war crimes in Ukraine, right? Um, and we have all sorts of amazing projects that are working with 
Filecoin Foundation and um, our sister organization, Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web, to use these technologies to support civil rights and human rights um, and civil liberties. Um, so some additional examples of our partners include, for example, uh, the Freedom of the Press Foundation, uh, the Guardian Project, Witness. Um, these are just a few examples of the types of you know really phenomenal um, organizations that are building on top of our technology to use decentralized tech uh, to really further civil liberties um, in the broader world. So I want to steer towards some of the things that you know you're working on, uh, broadly speaking. I know we caught up. I think it was in June in Austin, Texas. We caught up about some stuff that y'all were doing in space. Uh, yeah, very curious, I guess, what, five months later, where that stuff stands. Give me an update on like Lockheed Martin, all that good stuff. Yes, yes, yes. That's one of my favorite projects that oh, we're working oh, on right oh, now. Uh, Zach and I, we, we, we chatted about that uh, in Austin uh, at Phil Austin. Um, so what that project is, um, is that the Filecoin Foundation announced earlier this year uh, that we partnered with Lockheed Martin uh, to bring IPFS to space. Um, and so IPFS is, uh, stands for the Interplanetary File System, and it was really envisioned from the beginning that this was a technology that could actually enable networking over really long distances. Um, and the reason for that is that you know, today's centralized internet model really doesn't scale to space. Um, so imagine that you're trying to get data using the centralized internet model of today, where when you look for data, you look for it in a particular location. Um, you know, often that location might be, let's say, Earth, and let's say you're out by the moon, you're a satellite flying around. Um, you know, that's a multi-second delay every time you're trying to get data from Earth. Or if you're out by Mars, that's a multi-minute delay every time you're trying to get that data. Um, so there are these really big delays over these large, uh, these, these large distances. And um, so if you have to take that delay every single time you're retrieving data, it really doesn't scale. Um, IPFS was sort of envisioned as a solution to that because instead of looking for data by where it is, you're looking for data by what it is. So you're looking for a particular content ID and you'll retrieve that from wherever is closest. So maybe you already retrieved that data. You'll retrieve it from, um, or maybe someone very close to you uh, has that data or a piece of hardware close to you has that data. Maybe there's a satellite flying by with that data, right? Um, and so suddenly you're able to actually get data from wherever is closest. Um, and that really is something that can enable you to scale um, across these really vast distances. Um, so so what we, what we announced earlier this year is that we are partnering with Lockheed Martin uh, to actually bring IPFS to space and really uh, demonstrate how it can be the fundamental infrastructure um, for the, the future space economy. Um, and we are actually going to be, uh, we are, we are um, hard at work here, um, and we're going to be announcing the details of those missions or mission um, in the coming months. So stay tuned. Really exciting stuff coming. Uh, out of our uh, partnership with the with Lockheed Martin Space. Do you have a space flight booked? Come on, tell me. Or do you, do you personally have a space flight booked right now? <laughs> I'm not going to blow there? the surprise, Zach. All right, okay. I'll leave it at that. All right, we got a couple minutes left, so I think we should necessarily kind of look forward in terms of what's coming in 2023. I think obviously some of the stuff we heard earlier about FVM is pretty exciting. That would be what I would want to talk about, but I want to open it to you in terms of exciting sort of application or other developments with the network that you see coming to the fore in the new year. Yeah, I'm so excited about what we have in store for this next year. Um, you know, we have all these amazing partners. Um, one of the things you've heard about today is our um, public data commons initiative, where what we're doing is actually working with governments around the world to put those government data sets onto the Filecoin network. Um, and you also heard about our partnership with the Internet Archive to support the Democracies Library Project, which is sort of part of this broader initiative where we're going to be working with the archive to uh, collect those government data sets from around the world and put them onto the network. So I'm super excited about that. Um, obviously, so excited about everything that's happening with the Filecoin virtual machine. Um, I think that's going to 
going to be a big part of our plans for 2023 and a big part of what the foundation is supporting. Um, and then we have all these amazing partners who you heard from today, um, you know, from Jonathan Doten uh, to the Guardian Project uh, to the Freedom of the Press Foundation and Witness. Um, and I'm really excited to see what they're what they're doing this next year um, using the Filecoin network, using decentralized technologies um, to to really um, preserve human rights um, all across the world. I'm I can't wait to see what they accomplish, um, and I'm I'm just absolutely thrilled um, to see how this ecosystem is just really broadening and all these amazing use cases we're seeing. Um, I think 2023 is going to be a pretty big year. Cool. Nice callback to the foundational reason you're here in the first place. All right, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Marta. I appreciate the update. Join me in thanking Marta Belcher for uh, this nice little chat.